spiritual growth milestones. Good morning, guys. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. It's time to wake up. Welcome to Grace Bible Church this morning. Good to see all of you. Just a couple of announcements uh, from last week. Uh, don't forget, after worship today, uh, our meals ministry, which is a ministry that gets food to those that have gone through a sickness or an illness and need a little help. Um, if you would like to be a part of that, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back on the table back there. Please make sure you do that. And then for all the ladies, don't forget, there is a questionnaire back there. It's not a long one, two or three questions. 
about the ladies' ministry. I want to get your thoughts on it. Make sure before you leave today uh, that you uh, fill out that questionnaire. Our Tenebrae service, our Good Friday service, is coming up in a couple of Fridays, uh, March the 29th. It will begin at 7 o'clock. Again, uh, for those of you that have been here for that, you, you, you know we do things a, a lot differently that night. Uh, first of all, the idea behind the service is to at least feel, to some degree, the emptiness, the hopelessness that the disciples felt after the day of the crucifixion. And as we all know, they weren't expecting the resurrection. It came as much of a shock to them as it did to anybody and everybody else, though Jesus had told them about it numerous times. I don't think they really believed him. And so uh, when you come that evening, you come in silence. And then when we finish, and the church will be dark, uh, when you finish, as unlike a typical Sunday morning, we don't spend time fellowshipping. We leave in silence, get in our cars, and go home. I would encourage you to ask the Lord between now and then you know to search your heart let him take a deeper look a deeper examination uh, my, my verse has been Hosea chapter 10 verse 12 asking God to break up my fallow ground because it is time to seek the Lord but uh, you may have a different prayer different interest God may be dealing with you about I would encourage you sometime between now and the Tenebrae service to read through whichever gospel account or all four gospel accounts of the crucifixion. I just finished reading yesterday, Mark chapter 15, and it's, uh, it, it's just sobering. And, uh, and uh, I just encourage you to make sure you prepare yourself for it. Still selling books back there, paperbacks are a dollar, hardbacks are two. And then, Candid Conversations, our question and answer time. For those of you visiting, uh, whenever there's a fifth Sunday in the month, uh, instead of a sermon, we do question and answers. Well, the fifth Sunday is Easter. That's March 31st, so the next Sunday, April the 7th, I think it is, April the 7th, uh, will be Candid Conversations. If you have a question, you can email it to me, you can text me, or you can write it on your information card and give it to me after the worship service. Let's prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Let's bow before him in a moment of quiet, a moment of prayer. Father, the scriptures tell us to come and to worship, to bow down and kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For you are our God, and we are your people, your sheep. Father, for many of us, church and attending a worship service has been bred into us since childhood. I am one of those. And it is so easy to just take it for granted. We forget 
that we have gathered here to meet the king. To meet our creator. To meet our sustainer. To meet our redeemer. And our soon and coming king. Your Lord. There is nothing as Abraham Kuyper said, Father, there is nothing on this earth that you do not say, it is mine. And so as we come into your presence today, remind us in the words of the psalmist to bow down. To be reminded that you are God. And we are not. May we declare your praise. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand together. Share the creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty. Maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ. His only begotten Son. Our Lord. Who was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. But the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father Almighty. From this he will come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
You may be seated. Let's have all the children come on up. All the children come on up here. How's everybody doing today? Good, I'm glad to hear it. Come on up, guys. Come on up. Over the last few weeks, we have been learning something that comes from the book of Job that your mom and dads and I have been going through while you're in Sunday school, and that is that pain is a gift from God. And we've been learning why that is. Why would pain be considered a gift? Because let's be honest, pain don't feel good, does it? I agree, pain doesn't feel good. So why would God give us the ability to feel pain? So give me one reason why we've learned so far. One reason. <coughs> It is going to teach us something, that's for sure. We're going to come back to that in just a second. It tells us something's wrong. It tells us something's wrong. Say that with me. It tells us something's wrong. When there's pain, that tells you there's something wrong. What else does pain do for us? Here's another thing. Think with me now. It not only tells us there's something wrong, it prevents further damage. Say that with me. It prevents further damage. Let's say that again. It prevents further damage. So pain is a gift from God because it tells us something's wrong and it prevents further damage. And then last week we started with the third reason that pain is a gift from God. Pain gets our attention. Say that with me. Pain gets our attention. Let's say it again. Pain gets our attention. One more time. Pain gets our attention. See, sometimes, as I'm sure you've experienced, and I, when I was your age, I experienced, I would do stuff wrong. And my mom and dad would discipline me, and that didn't feel too good. But it got my attention that I had done something wrong. And then back to your point, it's only when God has our attention because sometimes we treat God, everybody look at me please, everybody look over here. Sometimes we treat God the way we treat other people. He'll be talking and we're not listening. We know somebody's talking but we, we're just, our brain's not there. We're not paying attention. And so sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes pain is a way of God getting our attention so he can speak to us and teach us. Because sometimes we don't learn our lessons if we're not listening. And so pain gets our attention. Say that with me. Pain gets our attention. One more time. Pain gets our attention. Okay, you're dismissed. Bibles open them up to Job chapter 38. For those of you that are visiting with us, we began this series in the first Sunday of January, and now this is sermon number 10. We have spent the last four or five weeks walking through the disputes, the debate, the arguments between Job and his friends, that part of Job that we are least familiar with. If you've been reading with us through this book, as I hope you have, 
in many respects, this is the moment you've been waiting for. It is certainly the moment that Job had been waiting for. For God to show up and speak to him. And as the old statement goes, be careful what you ask for. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you. And you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far shall you come, and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Have you commanded the morning since your days began, and caused the dawn to know its place? What it might take hold of the skirt, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it. It is changed like day under the seal and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? <clears throat> Have the gates of death been revealed to you, or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory? that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. A little sarcasm there if you haven't picked up on it. Have you entered, have you entered the storehouses of the stove? And have you seen the storehouses of the hell? which I have reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war. What is the way to the place where the light is distributed, or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? Who has left a channel for the torrents of rain, and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on a land where no man is, on the desert where there is no man to satisfy the waste and the desolate land and to make the ground sprout with grass. Has the rain a father or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the frost of heaven. The waters become hard like stone, 
and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades, loose the cords of the Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Can you guide the bear with its children? Did you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts, given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? Who can tilt the water skins of the heavens? when the dust runs into a mass and the cleft and the clods stick fast together. Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their thicket? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to God for help? and wonder about the lack of food. Let's pray. Father, a few minutes ago, we sang that you are indescribable, that you are uncontainable. We sang of your revelation in the heavens and on the earth. Who has told the lightning bolt where it should go? You are amazing, God. There is none like you. And so, Lord, over these next few minutes, as I woefully and inadequately try to walk us through this and the chapters that follow. I pray that you will take my offering as you did that young man's bread and fish. Break it and bless it and feed your people. That we as individuals, as families, and as a church will stand in all of you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Almost from the beginning of human history, human beings have been putting God on the witness stand. And demanding that he answer our questions. Why do bad things happen to good people? Even the disciples wanted to know, Lord, when are you coming back? Who are you, God? Why have you let this happen to me. We've been doing it since day one. Job's been doing it since chapter four.
It is just part of who we are. And then in chapters 4 to 37, Job's friends put Job on the witness stand. They question him. They accuse him. They charge him with sin. Or else all these bad things would not have been happening to him. The old retribution principle that we talked about. The good prosper, the evil suffer. And then in Job 4 to 37, in response to his friends, Job puts God on the witness stand, as we've talked about. And let's stop here just a second. Before I go any further, there is nothing wrong with answering and asking questions. That's how we learn. Four times a year, instead of a sermon, we do question and answers. I have operated since the day I began pastoring this church over 30 years ago that every honest question deserves an honest answer. And that there are too many people out there who have grown up in a church and then left the faith, or at least left the church, maybe struggling with their faith, why? Because they were afraid to ask questions. I do not ever want us to be that kind of church. Asking questions of the Bible, asking questions of the text of Scripture. Who wrote this? Who did he write it to? When did he write it? Why did he write it? That's how you study the Bible. By asking questions of the text. One of the questions every time I prepare a sermon, one of the questions that's in the back of my mind, what did this text mean to the people who heard it the very first time? Then and only then do I ask the question, what does this text then mean to us today? But we don't want to fall into the trap of many of Jesus' enemies. The motive behind your questions also often will determine whether or not you get an answer. I've been reading through the Gospel of Mark the last 10 days or so, about a chapter a day. And you have in chapter 12 the Sadducees who do not believe in resurrection asking Jesus a question about the resurrection. And they were not interested in the answer. They were trying to test him and to trap him. And guess what? Jesus felt no obligation to answer their question. When the Pharisees asked him, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? You know, Jesus really never did come out and say yes or no. He just said, look at this coin. Whose seal is on it? Give to Caesar what belongs to him. Give to God what belongs to him. If you're asking a question to make an accusation or to test, but you're not interested in learning, don't be surprised if you don't get an answer. Now, today's sermon covers chapter 38 to 41. I just read chapter 38. The other chapters are very, very similar. In chapters 38 to 41, God puts Job on the witness stand and asks him 77 questions. And oh, by the way, if you look at those first four verses of chapter 38, these were not rhetorical questions. 
God was expecting Job to answer. Now, for those of us that have been going through this book over the last 10 Sundays, it, you may find these chapters disappointing. Because, and I've warned you ahead of time, the questions Job had been asking God, God doesn't answer. As one author, as one author says, God gives no answer to Job's questions. No apology for having been silent for so long. No hint about Satan's wager and no apparent acknowledgement of Job's struggle. Before we get into some of the details, let's do a quick overview of these four chapters. This is the final part of the poetic section. Remember, chapters one and two are poetry. There's a small part of an earlier chapter that's prose, but almost all of chapters 4 to 37, or 4 to 41, are poetry. And then we'll come back to prose when we get to the epilogue at the end of the book where Job's wealth and family and those things are restored. Secondly, in these chapters, with the exception of chapter 40, verse 3 through 5, God is doing the talking. Chapter 40, Job makes a quick response, and then in chapter 42, Job has another quick response. So you've got God speaking up to chapter 40, Job quick response, God speaks again through chapter 41, and then in chapter 42, Job has a response. When you sit and read this, and I hope you have, it is extraordinary. As I mentioned in the very first sermon, even secular literary professors recognize that Job may be some of the greatest, if not the greatest literature found in the Bible and certainly in history. And these chapters are almost really the climax of that. It's one thing to say, God reveals himself in nature. As Psalm 19 and Romans 1 both make clear. But it's another thing to read four chapters of poetry. And as I said in the very first sermon and then in the fourth sermon when we got into some of this, and, and, and this is so hard for me, I confess this. When the Bible speaks to you through poetry, and there's a lot of poetry in the Old Testament especially, God is wanting you to feel something as well as to learn something. And that was true for Job. God did want Job to learn something. But he also wanted Job to feel something. The first section of these chapters focuses on God's creative and sustaining power. After challenging Job's ability to debate him, God peppers Job with a series of questions that focus on God's creative ability, his care for the animal kingdom, and then he demands that Job answer his questions. And then in section two, he takes it to another level. He challenges Job to get ready to answer him like a man in chapter 40, verse six and seven. 
And there in Job 40, verse 6 and 7, a passage we will look at in more detail next week, God unveils Job's main problem, his condemnation of God in order to justify himself. Self-righteousness, as we pointed out a couple of sermons back. And then God, in chapters 39, speaks to two remarkable creatures called Behemoth and Leviathan. We'll talk about those in just a second. To basically call Job's attention to this fact. Job, you cannot tame those creatures. You cannot domesticate those creatures. They are more powerful strength-wise than human beings. Only I control them. Who are you to think you can do a better job than me? Job, you think you've got answers? You don't even understand how animals work. How they function. So in this sermon, we're going to focus on what God says. Next Sunday's sermon, we're going to focus on Job's response in these chapters. The two responses. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to look at God's final answer. For Job and for us. And so that'll kind of give you what the future holds. What does these three chapters or four chapters tell us? It's very simple. God has revealed himself in Scripture because God is doing the talking and in nature because he keeps referencing snow, rain, wind, lightning, thunder, and animals. Some of you will recall last year and the year before, we actually did an entire series of sermons on both natural revelation and special revelation. Spent six weeks doing a detailed look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Four lessons from these chapters. Number one, to quote Francis Schaeffer, God is there, and he is not silent. Job's greatest fear and concern is that God had abandoned him, that God was nowhere in the picture, and that God was silent and not speaking to him. And it's a fear that every one of us have wondered at some point or another, maybe not to the degree that Job did. And these chapters remind us that God is there and he was there all the time and that he's not silent at all. First of all, notice he spoke through a storm. Those of us familiar with scripture should know that's not unusual. Maybe the next great, uh, great example of God's revelation is Ex Exodus 19 where God descends on Mount Sinai and in my opinion makes it look like a volcano. Dark clouds, thunder and lightning, mountain shaking, no mention of lava, but it was enough to scare the living daylights out of the Israelites that were there. When God said, don't let them touch this mountain, nobody wanted to. Why does God speak to a storm? Two reasons. Number one, to hide his majesty. Because we can't bear to see him without him veiling himself, even in Jesus. And then to display his power. 
One author calls it God's revealing himself in a terrifying mystery. The prophet Nahum says the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. That's covenant language from Exodus 34. He will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. I've said this before and I'll say it again. God's revelation in nature is the great reminder. He is not a teddy bear. And for those of us who have been Christians a long time, there is a warning that familiarity breeds contempt. God speaks personally. It is the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, who speaks out of the whirlwind. This is the Hebrew word Yahweh. Some of you grew up hearing it called Jehovah. This is the personal covenantal name of God. Elohim, which is translated God, is a general word for God. It can refer to false gods, those that we would spell with a little g, as well as the big G, God. But Yahweh, is only used in reference to Israel's God, the God of the Bible, the God that is revealed in Christ, a personal covenantal name of God. And so God is revealing himself both as majestic and as somebody that you can talk to, but also somebody you need to listen to. Now, here's what's interesting. In the first two chapters of Job, God is referred to as Yahweh. But in chapters 4 to 37, he is never referred to as Yahweh. Only as El Shaddai, the Almighty. Now, when you read the book of Genesis, which refers to the Almighty God more than any other Old Testament book, you learn something about God, that the Almighty God is the one who shows up when every other power, place, plan, you name it, has been exhausted. It's who Jacob cried out to when he sent Benjamin, his youngest and last son, off with his brothers to Egypt. And he was basically saying, God, you are almighty. Please take care of my youngest boy. We see God moving in great moments of delivery, great moments of rescue all through the book of Genesis. But Bildad, Eliphaz, and Zophar, the three sons of Job, had taken this great name of a God of power and grace and turned it into a bludgeon and just hammered Job over and over and over again. But once again, the God of promise, the God of covenant, speaks to Job like he did to the man from us, Abraham, his contemporary. Job, you're not alone. I have come. 
you've been asking, here I am. Notice it definitely wasn't on Job's timetable. And when it was all said and done, it probably wasn't the conversation Job was expecting. But he does show up. He is there. And God's timing, as hard as this is to live with, is always right. Just ask Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Lazarus may have been dead for four days. Jesus wasn't late. And so Job's greatest fear has been addressed. I'm here. Time to listen. Question or point number two out of this passage. Not only does God speak because he's there, he's present and not silent. He reveals through what he has spoken his wisdom as seen in his creation. Job chapter 38 and 39. We see how everything has its place. In the words of the song that we sang, who has told the lightning bolt where it should go? Who has made arrangements for storehouses laden with snow? God has. How did he do that? By wisdom. Proverbs chapter 6 reminds us that it was wisdom that was present with God at all points of creation. But here's the question. Why does God spend all this time talking about skies and stars and animals? Surely there is a more appropriate topic of conversation for someone who for some weeks has been going through an appalling sense of isolation. Well, sometimes, and every one of you know this, Sometimes when you are struggling, when you feel alone, you feel isolated, you're at a place of depression, put whatever label you want to on it, you won't open up and talk until you feel safe. And you feel like there is somebody there that's going to listen. And we all know sometimes that's the problem with the people who come to you, but sometimes it's your problem. It goes both ways. Now Job knows I'm not alone. Now it's time to have the conversation. And this acts to at least another question. What is the tone of this text? Is God angry and going to try to humiliate Job and put Job in his place and say, I am God and you are not, dude, and you need just to get used to it? Is that his attitude? Or is it more like Matthew chapter 6, where I picture Jesus and the disciples walking through a field together and he says, consider the lilies of the field. how God takes care of them. See that bird flying there? I feed it too. Matthew chapter 6, beginning about verse 25, and Job 38 to 41 have a lot in common. Is the tone the same? First, God starts with the skies. Let me amaze you, says God, by the complexity and the intricacy of it all. He talks about the foundations of the earth. When the morning stars, those angels, also called the sons of God in the heavenly court, shout for joy. That joyous celebration of the Creator has been sung ever since. They're still singing. 
just like those cherubim are singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It is an eternal song. Job, who's holding the sea back? Where does light come from? Job, have you ever watched the lightning flash across the sky with those fingers of fire? How does that happen? Why does God let it rain on desert places where nobody lives? And then look at the constellations of the stars, which is also a reminder of the fact that those things have been known for a long, long time. Job assumed, or God assumed Job knew about the Pilates and the Orion. That next verse, which has a very unusual word that is used uniquely in the Old Testament, they're really not sure what it means, but given the context, it's probably talking about another constellation of stars. And then when he mentions the bear, he's not talking about a grizzly. He's talking about another constellation of stars. Job, look at the night sky. Something that, because of all of our city lights, we really don't get a sense of much anymore. And then he says, look at the animals. Can you hunt prey for the lion? Can you feed the raven? How about the fact that mountain goats give birth? Can you cause that to happen? And then I think with a little bit of a sense of humor, he chooses two animals at the opposite end of the spectrum. The ostrich and the war horse. Now we have often talked about in church how dumb sheep are. There's a great video on Facebook and probably TikTok and every other video thing out there of a guy rescuing a sheep out of a ditch and the sheep takes about two leaps and jumps right back into the ditch again. And so when God is calling us sheep, it's not a great compliment. <laughs> but there's another dumb animal that walks the earth and that's the ostrich. Now most of us know that the ostrich, when it scares, it puts its head in the stand. You know that an ostrich, when it lays its eggs, it just lays it and then runs off. They are not smart animals. But God, in his grace and glory, he created that ostrich. In fact, there may be a little hint that, Job, you're a lot like that bird. Ostriches are strong. But they're foolish. And yet they're part of God's glory and God's creation. And then the war horse. Again, most of us when we think of horses don't think of war horses. We don't think of cavalry charges. We don't think of horses carrying and pulling chariots. We don't think that when the average man of the Old Testament times, the average guy was probably five foot five to five foot six, how big a horse would look to him. And horses played an integral part of warfare up through really World War I and even to some degree in towing things and pulling things part of World War II.
the power, the thundering of the ground when there would be hundreds of them running at the same time. God made that. Both ends of the animal spectrum. God made the hawk. God made the eagle. God made the owl. Job, you can't control any of them. What makes you think you can control your circumstances? What makes you think you can control the world? What makes you think that the world ought to work according to your plan when you can't control some of the simplest things that we take for granted in it? Bible says that the heavens declare the glory of God. How do they do that? When they simply do what God created them to do. When you see an otter acting foolishly and you see a lion acting majestically and you see an elephant thundering and everybody getting out of the way, that's God speaking. And that's them speaking to the glory of God. The question is always, are you listening? Am I listening? This world is good yet fallen. but we can still enjoy it. Worldliness does not mean you cannot enjoy the world God created, that you cannot find delight in blue skies and green grass and yellow dandelions. It wasn't earlier this week we had some thunderstorms roll through. What did you hear? When those thunderstorms rolled through, were you listening? Were you listening? Because that's God speaking. And we have lost something because because we know the science behind lightning and the science behind thunder and the science behind so many of these other things, we have lost a sense of awe, which science, when it really is doing its job, ought to increase our sense of awe. Because now we know the mechanics, we know the strong and the weak forces that are so finely tuned that if they move just a fraction in any direction, life could not exist on this planet. That ought to cause us to sit back and say, wow. Which, by the way, is part of the essence of worship. Wow. God speaks. He reveals his wisdom, and then he reveals his power. He speaks to two creatures. And let's not miss the point. I was amazed when I was researching these, this chapter a few weeks ago in detail how much ink has been spilt on trying to figure out whether this animal was an ancient dinosaur still walking around behemoth or a hippopotamus or 
a fire-breathing dragon or a crocodile. That's not the point. Whether it is a dinosaur and a dragon or whether it is a hippo and a crocodile, don't mess with them. Joe, you can't control them. I'm the only person in the universe that's got a handle on these two frightening, terrifying creatures. Only me. You can't do it. You can't domesticate it. This is why when you see that only God can control both nature and animals, this is why you can trust the promises of God when he says there's nothing that can separate you from the love of Christ. How do you know God can keep that promise? Look at what he can control. And that you can't. And then in chapter 40, I know we didn't read it, but I'm going to read a portion of it now. We see the justice of God. Wisdom, power, and justice revealed in nature. Listen to this passage, and I'm going to be reading this from the paraphrase, the message, because I really thought after studying it that old Eugene Peterson, he gets the sense of it. God addressed Job next from the eye of the storm, and this is what he said. I have some more questions for you, and I want straight answers. Do you presume to tell me what I'm doing wrong? Man. Do you presume to tell me what I'm doing wrong? Are you calling me a sinner so that you can be a saint? Do you have an arm like my arm? Can you shout and thunder the way I can? Go ahead, show your stuff. Let's see what you're made of, what you can do. Unleash your outrage. Target the arrogant and lay them flat. Target the arrogant and bring them to their knees. Stop the wicked in their tracks. Make mincemeat of them. Dig a mass grave and dump them in it. Faceless corpses in an unmarked grave. I'll gladly step aside and hand things over to you. You can surely save yourself with no help from me. Job has been complaining all through these chapters of the way God runs the world. I'm going to summarize chapter 40 for you. You think you can do better? Why do bad things happen to good people? That's always the classic one, isn't it? And they try to hook you on the horns of a conundrum there that if God is all-powerful but he won't end suffering. That means he doesn't care, therefore is not worthy of worship. And if he's not capable of ending suffering, that means he's not all powerful. And so, you know, he's not much different than I am. That's kind of how the argument goes and things like that. And so, I've never tried this yet, but I'm going to because maybe because I'm a pastor, I get these questions more often than you do. But you probably get them a little more often than you think you do. But the next time I get in this conversation, I'm going to ask the, the questioner, hey, I want you to design a world that is full of free moral agents that can do as they want and as they wish that doesn't have suffering in it. 
You do it. You do it. That's basically what God is saying to Job in these things. You think you can bring justice to the world? Listen. The United States is not perfect, but we've got a pretty good system of government, and every one of us know it's not perfect. It may be the best, but it's far from perfect. And we also know that any system of government is only as good as the people who are in the positions of influence and power. And so while there is a cry within us for justice, Ecclesiastes warns us, don't be surprised if you go to the courthouse and see injustice at work. Don't be surprised. God is basically saying to Job, can you do better? Do you have the ability to make sure justice is always being done. God is there. He is not silent. And yes, sometimes as we sang in that last song, we have to wait with anticipation for God to show himself. God has revealed his wisdom. He's smarter than we are. His power. He is more powerful than we are. And his justice. He is more just than we are. In other words, God's answer to Job's questions is look at me through the eyes and lens of creation. It does speak if you're willing to listen. God is always speaking. We are not always listening. God's answer to Job, now hear me, because if you've been at this church any degree of time at all, you know I'm a lover of doctrine, I'm a lover of theology, I'm a lover of philosophy. I like to think about the big questions. But notice that God's answer to Job is not a doctrine, not a philosophy, not even a truth. It's himself. Look at me, Job. Listen to me, Job. It's a revelation that should provoke awe. God's answer to Job is now that you know what you do not know. And that's the point that Job had to learn. Job, you need to learn what you don't know. And here's the problem with a modern audience to Job 38 to 41. Because of science, technology, we think we can answer these questions. All 77 of them. Therefore, who needs God? God says, I put a boundary on the sea. One of the things that we hear so much of today is climate change. That the polar ice caps are melting. That the oceans are going to rise. Do you realize that at one time in the history of this planet, half of the continent of North America was covered with ice? How much coal were we burning to cause that to happen? Think about that. And that's not to say that we should not be good stewards of creation that we should make sure our water stays as clean as possible and that we don't chop down every tree in sight. All of that it can be true without worshiping the created thing. But you know what? 
We've got the idea in our head, at least a lot of us, that we can control nature. And what does the Bible say? Be a steward of nature. Notice the difference. Be a steward of nature. That's Genesis 1. But don't ever think you can control it. That's why we are so frustrated as modern people by hurricanes and tornadoes. There's nothing we can do about it except, again, try to control global warming which this planet has been warming and cooling since its beginning. That's where you take a good thing, stewardship, and make it an ultimate thing. That's idolatry. When you're going through what Job's going through, guys, here's the bottom line, I think. And I think this book as an entirety bears this out. Can you trust God in spite of your circumstances? Remember the sermon from a couple weeks ago. Don't judge God by your circumstances. That's going to get you in trouble every time. Because your circumstances change. They go up, they go down. Things are good, things are bad. And over a lifetime, if you let your circumstances cloud your view of God, your attitude toward God is going to go up and down and up and down and up and down. Can you trust Him as He is revealed in Scripture? And more importantly, this side of the cross, can you trust Him? the one who died on the cross. Listen to this final passage out of 1 Peter. Chapter 2. What credit is it if? Now listen to this. When you sin and are beaten for it, you endure. But if when you do good, and suffer for it, you endure. This is a gracious thing in the sight of God. And I hope we've established Job had done nothing deserving of that tragedy. If you do good and suffer for it and endure, it's a gracious thing. Now, for to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example. In other words, not only is the cross of Christ the price for our sin, our redemption, it's an example for us to follow when we suffer. Now listen, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Now look at this last phrase if you're following me. Listen, listen carefully. But continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Did you hear that? When Christ was suffering on the cross, he was continually entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. Even Christ in his incarnation was trusting his father because he knew his father was just. And that his father knew I had committed no sin. So the question is, when you go through your suffering 
and you take up Christ as your example, and you do not revile, will you entrust yourself to the one who judges justly, who knows more than you do, who is able to do things you cannot do, and is just in a way that you and I will never be. Can you trust that God when your world goes to hell? Can you trust him? Will you trust him? Let's pray. Lord, I hope and I pray that we have had a greater appreciation for the incomparable God. That you are truly uncontainable. that you are the one who, well, as you told Abraham, there is nothing too hard for me. Nothing too hard for me. When Jesus was talking, Lord, to his disciples and they wondered who then could be saved, he said, with men this is impossible, but with me all things are possible. You gave the Apostle Paul the words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you have told Job, Job, it's not about what you can do, it's about what I do. And yet, Lord, in our technological digital age, we think we know more than we do. We think we can do better than we really can do. Lord, we think we have abilities we really don't have. And Father, I'm afraid sometimes we really sincerely believe it. And so Lord, I hope and pray that as we sing this final song, as we reflect on what we have heard today, what we have sung today, our prayers today, that we would simply be in awe. That we will truly declare your glory. Not just when we're gathered here on Sunday, but tomorrow morning when we wake up and the sun begins to rise and you begin to shed your light Lord, help us to take a moment and look around. As springtime comes and the birds return, insects begin to crawl again, spiders start to build their webs. Help us to take just a moment and look. You are an amazing God. Take a moment there and let the Holy Spirit speak to you and we're going to finish with a song.
Let's stand together and let's worship the Lord. God we have. There is simply, as John Stott one put it, no rivals. He is unique among them all, and we praise the Lord for that. Glad you're here. Just a reminder of announcements. Ladies, don't forget to fill out that questionnaire before you leave. I know we love to sit around and talk. Please do that while you're standing around talking. Grab a questionnaire and 
you know, spit and chew gum at the same time type thing. And then don't forget, we need people to sign up that if you're willing to bring a meal to a family that, you know, is going through a sickness, a birth or whatever, they just need a little help for a few days. Uh, you don't have to feed them every day, just feed them one out of many days. Please sign up for that. And then I, forget to, I forgot to mention this at the beginning. Uh, if you're interested in being a member of Grace Bible Church, you want to stop dating and get married, well, uh, next, uh, next Sunday afternoon from 4 to 6 o'clock, uh, we're going to have a pre-membership class. And I need to know if you're coming and make sure you have had some material to read before you come. And so if you're planning on coming, Please let me know if you need the pre-membership material. Please let me know. Now, let me say this. I know Sunday afternoons are not always a convenient time. If you want to, and are interested in being a member of this church, you call me. You set an appointment with me. I'll meet you in a coffee shop. I'll meet you at your house. I'll meet you here at the church on a day other than Sunday. I'll meet you anywhere and everywhere. Uh, uh, we'll make it convenient for you. But the main thing is to make sure you get that material and read it ahead of time. And so please, please do that. And, uh, but I look forward to seeing any of you that come. And, and also let me say this. Um, coming to the class, whether I do it with you and your wife and kids privately or whether we do it in the class, you're under no obligation to join at the end of that. I'm going to leave the covenant with you and you sign it at your convenience. I'm not bragging about this, but there has been at least three times over the years where somebody came to our pre-membership class and they never came back to this church ever again. <laughs> so it happens sometimes, and uh, which that's the purpose of it, to let you know what you're getting into. And uh, because trust me, we are a good church. But we're still pilgrims, and we're still learning, and we are nowhere near what one day will be when we have the great supper of the Lamb, and we are robed in white. Then we'll be all we can be. Until then, we're works in progress here. Love you guys. Have a great rest of the day. Let's sing the doxology, and we'll be dismissed. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.